I'm not like you. I assume you're like me. I grew up my whole life thinking that was the Velociraptor, the big one. Why? Because that was all I, was, all I ever heard. But that's another side of the story. And that's what I want to show you today. This idea that dinosaurs prove evolution, I want to show you that when you start with the Word of God and they look at dinosaur bones, they fit what the Bible says about creation and the flood much better. That's another side of the story, and that's what I want to show you today. So, of course, in the latest movies, Jurassic World, they make them even bigger, and they just call them raptors altogether. But it's the same way. When we go to school, when you go to school, pub, public schools, you go, turn on the TV, you go to museums, what do we learn about? Creation or evolution? Evolution, millions of years. And so when people think about dinosaurs, they think of evolution and millions of years. So if you have this question, so what, what comes to mind when you think about dinosaurs? When I say dinosaurs, do you have this image in your mind of maybe a volcano at the back and strange-looking plants? Do you have that in your mind? Why do you have that image? See, whether we realize it or not, many of us are subconsciously influenced by the culture around us. Okay, but when you start with the Word of God, you don't have that picture. See, if you believe in evolution, this is what you believe. You believe 13.7 billion years ago, there was the Big Bang, and that's cosmic evolution. And all the planets form. And then out of the primordial soup, you have the very first life. That's chemical evolution. And from that one single life form, it evolved into all other life forms that we see today. That's called biological evolution. But when you start with the Bible, you have a very different picture of history. The Bible tells us God created the world about 6,000 years ago. He created the world in six days. There was the real Adam and Eve, and they fell into sin in the Garden of Eden. And when they fell into sin, they brought sin, death, and suffering into this world. Later on, there was a worldwide flood where God destroyed all creatures on, on the earth, on, on the land, that breathed air through their nostrils, and on, except for those that were on board the ark. And after the flood, there was the Tower of Babel where people spread out all over the world. So the Bible gives us a very different picture of history from what we hear from the circular Big Bang evolutionary biologists. So why are we speaking about this? Well, it really boils down to this issue, doesn't it? Can we trust what the Word of God says? You see, in creation ministries, we call dinosaurs missionary lizards <laughs> because we believe that these two dinosaurs that have been used to promote the idea of evolution when you train yourself, you equip yourself, you can use this as a stepping stone to share the gospel, show your friends that, hey, God's word can be trusted. You see, I want you to train yourself to think about dinosaurs starting from the Bible. And I know like you, we all love quiz, so here's a little quiz for you. So the T-Rex, its teeth is really sharp, it's six inches long. What was its original diet? Plant eater, meat eater, scavenger, or was it plant and meat eater? So who thinks that the original diet of the T-Rex was plants? Okay, a few of you. Meat? Scavenger? Plant and meat? Okay, remember what I say? Let's start from the Word of God. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1, when God created all animals at the very beginning, what did He create them to eat? Plants. There was no death, no disease, no suffering. Creatures were not eating one another before sin entered the world. It was a very good creation. So creatures only began to eat one another after sin had entered the world. But if dinosaurs were created to eat plants, and later on they eat meat, how do we know what they eat? Have you ever wondered? Well, there are a few clues. We can look at the fossils. So for example, here we see that this dinosaur must have been snacking on another dinosaur because the teeth marks are found. If they can actually ma match the size and the shape of the teeth, to some of these holes that you find in the dinosaur bones. Here's another one. Here you have a T-Rex tooth that is stuck in between two joints of this dark blue dinosaur. That's a hedrosaur, dark blue dinosaur. And in fact, this dinosaur survived the attack. And we know that because these two joints, they actually heal around the tooth and fuse the bones together. So can you imagine how much pain this dinosaur must have experienced walking around with this tooth stuck in its tail, fusing its bones together? That's suffering. That should tell you that the fossil record that we see is not a record of millions of years. It's a record of an event that took place after sin had already entered the world. 
the worldwide flood. And I'll talk about that later on. But here you can see that some dinosaurs, they created to eat plants, but later on, after sin entered the world, they began to eat one another. Another way we know what dinosaurs eat is by looking at their droppings. So here we have fossilized droppings. You know, many years ago, when I was a teenager, I, started, I, I talked to my friends about this. I would be a bit mischievous. I will take a piece of fossil dinosaur dung, and I, I will not tell them what it is. I pass it around, I say, smell it, taste it, and guess what it is. <laughs> okay, I will not do that to you today. But when you look at fossil droppings of dinosaurs, we can tell what they eat. Sometimes we see fragments of bone or grass in there. But what else do we tell? What can we see? Sometimes we find the remnant of grass. And that was a surprise for evolutionists. See, evolutionists used to teach that grass did not come into existence until 10 million years after dinosaurs died out. But guess what we find in dinosaur dropping? Grass. And so here it says here in this New, uh, new Scientist article, depicting dinosaurs munching on grass was considered by experts to be as foolish as showing prehistoric humans hunting dinosaurs with spears. Because according to evolution, grass did not yet exist at the time of dinosaurs. Yet science has caught up. So here you can see the remnants of certain grass. You can identify the species of grass just from um, the droppings, the remnants that's in there. And yet if you go into the museum here in, the, in Atlanta, we actually see this. It says that the grass did not yet exist in the time of dinosaurs. They haven't updated the sign yet. Of course, now in the last 10 years, some evolutionists, they, they kind of accept that reluctantly, so they just change that. So what do they do? They just say grass must have existed, must have evolved far, be, far before that. We just don't really have the evidence for that. So in Creation Magazine, this is a magazine that we produce. It's a quarterly magazine. It's a family magazine. And this is something we have in there. Grass eating dinosaurs, a time travel problem for evolution. Take an article like that, go to your kids. Talk to them about fossil dung. We all, kids love fossil dung, right? Talk to them about it and show that, hey, look, this matches what the Bible says much better. Because the Bible says God created everything within the six days of creation. What else can we tell? Here, we, sometimes we not only have dinosaur fossils, we have the remnants of what they eat in their stomach. And here we have the remnant of three birds in the dinosaur stomach. You say, wait a minute, dinosaur eating birds? How can that be? Because, you know, if, if, if you open any evolutionary textbooks, they'll tell you that dinosaurs evolve into birds. But guess what we find in the stomach? Dinosaurs were eating birds. Here is another picture, you can even see in this paper, the remnants of three separate birds in this dinosaur stomach. In evolution, dinosaurs evolved into birds about 65 million years ago. This is using their dates, which I don't believe is true, dates back far before that, yet dinosaurs had birds in their stomach. Here's another picture of it. This is an artist's impression of what happened back then. <laughs> so we say that in, on our website, the recent discoveries of the contents of dinosaur stomachs pose a gut-wrenching challenge to the idea that dinosaurs gave rise to birds because it now turns out dinosaurs ate them. So dinosaurs ate birds, dinosaurs ate one another, what else were they eating? They ate grass, and dinosaurs ate mammals. Here we have the remnants of three mammal jaw in its gut. And we see that mammals ate small dinosaurs. And here you see the remnants of mammals. In the Sorry, a dinosaur in this mammal um, skeleton here. So what we see here is that dinosaurs were eating mammals, mammals were eat, and dinosaurs were eating birds, dinosaurs were eating, sorry, mammals eating dinosaurs, dinosaurs eating birds, dinosaurs eating mammals, dinosaurs eating grass, and the dinosaurs were eating other dinosaurs. A couple of years ago, I went back to Singapore, and they had a dinosaur exhibition there. And don't ask me why they had a dinosaur exhibition, I didn't see any dinosaurs there. But they had this sign here, and this sign say, dinosaurs didn't walk alone, they live alongside birds and mammals, such as this creature you see here. And this raccoon-looking mammal measured one meter in length and hunted smaller dinosaurs, such as the Sikakosaurus. So this is well understood. 
in the literature. Then we see that birds eat mammals. So here we have a bird with a mammal paw in its gut. And this bird species is also known to have eaten fish, birds, and reptiles. So they were all there at the same time. Where is your age of the dinosaurs? It's not there. Yet when was the last time you have been to a museum that you see mammals, dinosaurs, birds all in the same display? Why don't they do that? Because this doesn't fit that image that they have of an age of the dinosaurs. Yet in the fossil record, scientific papers like Nature, top papers, all recognize that all these creatures were around at the same time. But if the dinosaurs were, fossils were there, like I said earlier on, I said that they're good evidence of a worldwide flood. How do we know? What does the evidence tell us? Well, I love dinosaur fossils. Who love fossils here? Anyone? Quite a few of you. And if you know anything about dinosaur fossils, you know that the way we find them, they're often found in what we call dinosaur bone beds. But if you, how does a fossil form? If you go to a museum, you open a book, a textbook, this is what they will tell you. A dinosaur dies, and over millions of years, he's slowly being buried up. And that's all the rock layers you see here. And over millions of years later, due to erosion, the bones are exposed. And that is how we get for yourself a fossil. Can we get a fossil forming that way? Not really. See, how then do we explain this fossil forming? This cannot take millions of years. And what you're looking at here is that these two dinosaurs are fighting. This, uh, the very famous dinosaurs because they're in a the fighting pose. This dinosaur on the left, the Protoceratops, has actually beaten off the arm of the Velociraptor on the right. And the Velociraptor on the right has its claw in the neck of the dinosaur on the left. And they're fighting. And something happens so quickly that forever stuck in that fighting pose. Is that millions of years? Or is this rapid barrier? When we see something like that, that should tell you that this is evidence of catastrophe. Rapid barrier, something that went through the area so quickly that these creatures, massive creatures, were forever stuck in that fighting pose. This is an artist's impression. Notice, that cannot be millions of years old. They were frozen in time. But this is exactly what you would expect if there was a worldwide flood. Massive catastrophe all over the earth. Quick barrier of things everywhere. Preserving these things in its pose. In fact, if there is a worldwide flood, what will we expect to see? We expect to see very well-preserved fossils, billions of dead things all over the earth. And that's exactly how we find them. And one of the things about dinosaur bones, like I said earlier on, we often find them in what we call mass graveyards or dinosaur bone beds. So what are these? These are places where you see tens of thousands of dinosaur bones. They're all jumbled together in one big pile mixed together marine fossils like clams and fish. And this, in Canada alone, we have more than two dozen of such bone beds. Some of these formations, these are massive. They stretch for over one square mile in size. How do you get something like that? Surely all these dinosaurs did not say, hey, let's all die together in one corner. And why would their fossils be mixed together with marine fossils like clams and fish? But you see, if there was a worldwide flood, what would you expect? Well, you would expect to see water sorting action. So this flood would bring all these carcasses from huge areas together and rapidly burying them in one pile, mixed together with marine fossils and fish and clams. And that's how we get these dinosaur bone beds all over the world. Another way we find dinosaur bones is that a lot of these fossils, the dinosaurs that have the long necks, so the cephalopod dinosaurs and the theropod, the meat-eating ones, they have this long neck. A lot of their fossils take on this special pose, a death pose. The technical term is the opistotonic pose. But we just call that a death pose. And they all, the necks are bent backwards this way, and their tails are bent back in the opposite direction. How do we get something forming like that? You see, no creature slips like that. This was a mystery for many years until a scientist, Alicia Cutler, did some experiments. You see, this dinosaur, they have a ligament that runs down the back of the neck. And chickens, chickens have a long neck, and chickens have the same kind of ligament that runs down the back of the neck. What happens is that she took freshly killed chickens before they can harden, and she threw them in cold water. And now, when the, the chicken's alive, the, the neck doesn't bend back because of the weight of the body. 
But when she threw them in cold water, within seconds, all the head bent backwards. Because now, in cold water, the chicken, it's buoyant. And now the ligament contracts, and within seconds, they all take on that very same pose. And so she concluded this. Although the roads to the opistotonic death pose, just the pose you saw early on, the opist opistotonic death pose are many, immersion in water is the simplest explanation. So we see that dinosaur bone beds are formed because at the time of death, it was caused by a worldwide flood. Some of these formations over one square mile, and you follow the sediments, they cross continents at times as well. And we see that all these dinosaurs take on the death pose, their necks are bent backwards because at the time of death, they were in water. Do you see where I'm going with that? What about armored dinosaurs? How do we find their bones? See, armored dinosaurs, they don't have a long neck. But we have very well-preserved armored dinosaurs. So here we have one, and this was a nodosaur. This is in National Geographic. And this was this described as partially, mineral, partially mineralized, meaning that, meaning that it's not completely turned into stone. Three-dimensional preservation, remnants of its last meal in the stomach, patches of skin, reddish pigment, and dinosaur armor. Huge creature you can see is preserved in its three-dimensional shape. This huge creature was about 3,000 pounds, was believed to have been swept away in a flood river almost, in, almost 100 meters in the open sea, and then it was buried upside down. What kind of flood would sweep a big creature like this and bury that upside down? This was in June. Turns out that this nodosaur was the best piece of one of its kind. But one month before that in May, they found another preserved armored dinosaur in the best one of its kind. This time around, it was Ankylosaurus. This is the armored dinosaur that has a club at the end of the tail. This is in May. And again, the best preserved one of its kind. And they say abundant soft tissue preservation across the skeleton, including bony skin armor, skin impression, and keratin. That's protein. And again, the skeleton was buried, what? Upside down. May, one found upside down. June, another one found upside down. So in September, another group of scientists, they got very curious. So they looked at all these armored dinosaurs that they found in Canada. And they found that 70% of all armored dinosaurs that they find are actually found upside down. So they did computer simulation studies. Look at the balance and things like that. And they realized that when these dinosaurs are in water, they are very unstable, they are top heavy. So you place it in water, all you need is for a small wave to come along, and the whole thing goes total up. And so they say we use computer modeling to show that Ankylosaurus likely flip over while suspended in water. Do you see that? Armored dinosaurs are found upside down because they were in water. Dinosaur bone beds are found because at the time of death, these bones, all these carcasses were buried in water. Dinosaur necks are bent backwards because at the time of death, they were in? What does that tell you? There was a worldwide flood. That's the only way we can explain all these dinosaur bones. Start with the Word of God, and we have the correct worldview to understand what we're seeing before our very eyes. But does the Bible mention dinosaurs? Well, the Bible tells us that God created all creatures, land creatures, on day six. Dinosaurs are land creatures. So dinosaurs had to be created on the sixth day. God created man on the sixth day. Which means that when you start with the word of God, dinosaurs and man were both created today, together on the sixth day of creation. If the fall did not happen, something like that could have been very possible. Start with, with the word of God. That changes the way you understand dinosaurs and our history. But is the word dinosaur found in the Bible? No. Why not? Well, the word dinosaur is actually a very new word. It was only coined in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. It's a very new word. But the early translations of the Bible into English from the Greek and Hebrew were hundreds of years before that. Look at that. Dinosaurs only came much later on. So, of course, we don't find the word dinosaur in the Bible because the word was not yet coined. 
But in the Bible, in Job chapter 40, we have an interesting animal. And here we have an animal, and God is confronting Job with his creation. And one of the creatures that God challenges him with, this creature which we live untranslated in our English Bible as behemoth, which means the beast of beasts, the biggest land creature. And look at this. Look at how it describes this animal. Look at behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. Remember, it's grass like an ox. What strength is in his loin? What power in the muscle of his belly? He still moves like a cedar. His sinews and ties are close knit. His bones are like tubes of bronze. His limbs like rods of iron. Iron. He ranks first among the work of God. He still moves like a cedar. What's a cedar? A tree. So what creature that is the largest land creature that God created is grass like an ox and has a tail like a cedar. What's that? One of the long-necked dinosaurs. The several-pot dinosaurs. Some Bibles, they put a footnote there. Say behemoth, maybe at a footnote, say maybe it's hippopotamus, right? Maybe it's an elephant. So by the way, look at that. That's a cedar tree, right? What animal has a size that tree? A, a tail that size. Does it fit hippopotamus or an elephant? Let's give that a try. So the tail the size of cedar tree, does that match? <laughs> what about this? See, there's really only one creature that fits this, doesn't it? If you do not believe me, the next time you go to a zoo, take a few pictures for yourself. Is that a cedar tree? Or what about this? Poor creature, right? <laughs> There's only one description that fits one of the long-necked dinosaurs. Yes, the Bible does talk about dinosaurs. So God was confronting Job with a creature that Job was familiar with. That raises another question. When did Job live? Before the flood or after the flood? After the flood. How do we know that? There are a few passages in Job that talk about how God had already judged the wicked with a worldwide flood. So Job lived after the flood. Job was familiar with dinosaurs. That means that dinosaurs must have survived the flood. So dinosaurs had to be on board the ark. Do you see how starting with the Word of God gives you a different understanding of dinosaurs? So what we have looked at so far, we see the Bible tells us God created the world about 6,000 years ago. I'll, cover, I'll discuss this more in the next session at 1 p.m. But we see that God created dinosaurs on the sixth day together with men. They are created to eat plants. After the fall, some dinosaurs begin to eat meat. They were taken on board the ark before Noah's flood, and they were on the earth after the flood during Job's day. <coughs> but if dinosaurs lived with men, after the flood, and they only went extinct in more recent years. What evidence do we have to show that maybe people were familiar with these creatures? Here's one of my favorite ones, and what you're looking at here is an artifact. And this bronze basin is a wine basin from the 3rd century BC in China. What's this on the handles? Let's take another look at it. What's that? Is that one of the long neck several pot dinosaurs, like the Camarasaurus? In fact, I actually have this book that describes it. And this book was actually is, is, is in my office. It's in Chinese. They have all these bronze artifacts. And this particular one, they call that a dragon. You see, the word dragon in Chinese is long. And dinosaur is Kong Long. Okay, Kong Long. So you see long and Kong Long. See the relation there? Kong Long, dinosaurs, literally translated means terrifying dragon. So they call that a dragon alone in the book. But when this book got brought to the West, they retranslated the whole book. And the word dragon, they changed that into not dragon, but a long neck feline, a cat. Does that look anything like a long neck cat to you? <laughs> so why do you think they changed the translation to be a long neck feline or cat? Well, I believe if they say it was a dragon, that will sound very familiar to you, doesn't it? So this is in China. Let's leave China. Let's go to Cambodia. In Cambodia in the 12th century, this is Tapom Temple. It's part of the Angkor Wat Temple Complex. That's the world's biggest 
temple complex. It's a World Heritage Site. So we know this is real. It's not a forgery. And one of the temples that you see here was built in the 12th century. So way before they discovered dinosaurs in the 1800s. And on this pillar here, we have all kinds of animal engravings. You see that here? So you have water buffaloes, swans, parrots. And we have this thing in the center. What's that? So I actually have a replica of that here. I have a fossil table at the back with the books. Go ahead and check out some of the fossils for yourself. I'll put this at the back. And this is what it looks like, all right? It's one of the stegosaurus-like creatures. How would they know how to build something like that? So some skeptics say, oh, no, that's, that's not stegosaurus. That has to be maybe a rhino or maybe a chameleon. But have you looked at a rhino's tail? It's a thin, scrawny tail. And the chameleon tail, look at that curly thing at the end. But this thing has a thick tail at the base. And look at the plates at the back. This is clearly one of the stegosaurus-like creatures. You see, they cannot make sense of this because in their mind, dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. And dinosaur, stegosaurus fossils are never found in Cambodia. So it's not like somebody could have dig it out and try to reconstruct that. In fact, for the first 100 years, paleontologists in the 1800s, they used that to think that these vertical plates, they used to think it was flat, like a turtle shell. It was only later on they knew that it was straight like this. But all the way in the 12th century, people were engraving things like that. They had to be familiar with this creature. Another part of this very same temple, we have another very badly faded stegosaurus here. Look at that. This is in Cambodia. Let's leave Cambodia, let's leave China. Let's go to the UK. This is all around the world. So you go to the UK in Kalau Cathedral, a cathedral built in the 15th century. There was a bishop of that church. And when he died, this was his tombstone, 1496. And on this metal strip, we have animal engravings on it. So you go to the church, lift up the carpet, that is what you'll see. We have engravings of dogs, birds, bats, and what else do we see? What's that? Two long-necked dinosaurs together. And the dinosaur on the left is actually different from the one on the right. The one on the left is a long-necked dinosaur, but it has a tail with four backward-pointing spikes. There's only one several-pot dinosaur, a long-necked dinosaur, with four backward-pointing spikes. It's a Shunosaurus. We can identify the species just from the engraving itself. Shunosaurus fossils are never found in, in, in the UK. It's found in China. Yet all the way in the UK, people were engraving things like that. They must have seen these creatures. So if the evolutionary story of dinosaurs is true, these creatures should have died out millions of years before human beings walked the earth. So how could the images be engraved on a 500-year-old tomb in northern England? It's like this cartoon say. If people weren't around when dinosaurs were there, then who drew their pictures? So we see that all over the world, people were drawing these creatures and they only went extinct in more recent years. But don't the fossils themselves show that they are millions of years old? Well, not really. In 2005, an evolutionist, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, she found a T-Rex bone. And the bone is really big. So she brought it to her lab, she broke it open, and guess what she found? She found red blood cells. Obviously, not millions of years old. There you see, T-Rex, red blood cells. And she went back, she went to look at what she, what she had left. She dissolved away some of the minerals there. And what was left, she said it was flexible, resilient, when stretched, returned to its original shape. So here she began to look at other dinosaurs, and she found red blood cells, not just in T-Rex, but in dark blue dinosaurs, in triceratops, you see that? In many, many samples of dinosaurs over and over again. And when she dissolved in the minerals, like I say, flexible, resilient, when stretched, returned to its original shape. Look at that, red blood cells here. And this is a soft tissue after the mineral was dissolved. Looks like beef jerky, doesn't it? How can these things be millions of years old? She says this, it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course, I couldn't believe it. 
I said to the lab technician, the bones, after all, are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? Well, Dr. Schweitzer, could it just be that maybe the bones are not 65 million years old? You see, she's an evolutionist, so she cannot make sense of what she's seeing before her very eyes. As she began to look at it more, she began to find bone cells, and these are osteocytes and bone cells. You can even see the nucleus that's being stained in there. That's a depi stain test. The test of double helical DNA is still in there. She says this, I just got goosebumps because everybody knows these things don't last for 65 million years. As the fossils dissolved, transparent vessels were left behind. It was totally shocking. I didn't believe it until we have done it 17 times. 17 times? Who does an experiment 17 times? Do you know why? Because if you're an evolutionist, you believe the idea of millions of years, you cannot make sense of what you're seeing before your very eyes. Science tells us these things cannot even be a million years, let alone 65 million years. She said, after we had the data I didn't publish for over a year, I was terrified. Why? Because she knew that when she published this, her fellow evolutionists would begin to attack her. But when was the last time you see a scientist being afraid to publish their findings? They want to publish because that's, that's where they get research funding. But after she published her results, in another interview, she talked about how her research funds were cut. And she only had enough funding to continue her lab for another one and a half years because she had a private donor who came alongside her, uh, came alongside her to give her some extra funding. Of course, later on, she was able to secure more funding to find more stuff. But she was afraid. Why would a fellow evolutionist attack her for that? Because they know the implication of dinosaur soft tissue. Again, when I say soft tissue, I'm talking about original biomolecules, protein, DNA, that is still there. This is Mary Schweitzer on 60 Minutes. Let's see if we can get that playing. Okay, I don't think I hear the sound. Let's see if we can try that again. It happened by mistake. Okay, Mary this time. Oops. Back, okay. Happened next, happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You say, I didn't you want say, to tell anybody. <laughs> you'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, OK, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there things that look suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like, shocked. I mean, How could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones... Look at that. ...blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science that organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. Do you hear the irony in the last sentence? Right? Science tells us this thing cannot even last a million years. But do they ever question the billions of years? No. They appeal to an unknown science out there. And they didn't just find that, because later on they actually were able to isolate protein. So they found collagen which is quite a stable protein, but they also found delicate proteins like elastin and lamanin in what they claim was a dinosaur bone that is 80 million years old. And later on, they found collagen in what they claim was a bone 195 million years old. The, the thing is this, you can actually go into a lab, it can carry out experiments and test the maximum theoretical limit for how long it will take for collagen to break down. 
collagen is a stable protein. But even if you freeze it, you freeze it in liquid nitrogen, it can only slow down the decay process. The law of thermodynamics will still go on. The chemical bonds will still break down over time. And we know that the maximum theoretical limit, 300,000 to 900,000 years max, it will be all gone. You know, I believe this is too generous. But this is the figure that's given to us by the evolutionists themselves, their own experiments. So we just use their figure. All right? This is the maximum theoretical limit. And yet they claim to have fine bones, collagen in bones, that are 195 million years old. It doesn't make sense. The science doesn't add up. Coll collagen wasn't... I mean, dinosaurs didn't live in freezing liquid nitrogen, do they? If they live in climates like ours, in 15,000 years, all of that should be gone. Yet in time and time again, we find collagen bones with, the, with collagen and other organic <laughs> biomolecules. She says this, when you think about it, the loss of chemistry and biology and everything else that we know, say it should be gone. It should be degraded completely. You see what she's saying? Science tells us these things cannot be millions of years old. See, the skeptics that come up to you, say, you creationists, you cannot explain the science, so you say God must have done it. It's actually the other way around, isn't it? Everything we know from science tells us that these things cannot be millions of years old. I have news for you. If you still want to believe that these bones are millions of years old, you are being unscientific. Good science tells us that all these things cannot even be one million years old. Because even if you can satisfy all these conditions, background radiation itself will be enough to destroy all biomolecules in less than one million years. And this is just another paper from just August last year. See, although many analytical techniques have shown that organic materials can be preserved in fossils for millions of years, how do they know it can be preserved for millions of years? Well, because we find dinosaur bones and they contain collagen, so it must be millions of years old, right? Well, how do they explain that? Let's read the rest of the sentence. The geochemical factors that allow this preservation are not well understood. They don't know. Because good science tells us these things are not that old. Here's another very well-known dinosaur expert, evolutionist. He says this, bones do not have to be turned into stone to be fossils. And usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. They don't tell you that in the museums, do they? So if you look at all the scientific papers that we have, top circular papers, nature, plus one, things like that, how many examples of dinosaur soft tissue do we have in the scientific literature? I actually maintain a database with Dr. Brian Thomas from the Institute of Creation Research. And Brian Thomas, by the way, he got his PhD looking at ancient collagen. So this is an area you can get your PhD in. It's a well-established field. We maintain this database, cataloging all these circular papers. Every few months, we have to update this because it keeps increasing. To date, we have 59 documented papers talking about organic, original organic dinosaur biomaterial. And if we don't just look at dinosaurs, what if we look at extinct um, marine reptiles, we look at, at bacterial layers, fossilized bacterial layers and all that. We are up to 122 papers of so-called ancient biomaterials. So using the evolutionary dates, which I do not believe is true, what is the record holder? The record holder is bacterial molecules, which they claim is 2.5 billion years old, and we still find original organic biomaterial. No evolutionists, they believe that the rock layers is a record of time. The further down you dig, the further back in time you go. As creationists, we believe that the rock layers is mainly a record of the worldwide flood. But they believe the further down you go, you're going back in time. So you go all the way down to one of the very first life that you find using the evolutionary time scale. And we still find original organic biomolecules. Doesn't make sense if the earth is billions of years old. But when you start with the word of God, everything matches perfectly. This is exactly what we would expect. So dinosaur soft tissue, which history does this fit best with? The Bible. Mary Schweitzer says this, so that leaves us with two alternatives for interpretation. Either the dinosaurs aren't as old as we think they are, or maybe we don't know exactly 
how these things get preserved. That's the evolutionist evolution of the gaps. Because we know from science that these things cannot last for even a million years. So what's the only alternative? The dinosaurs aren't as old as we think they are. Aren't as old as the way evolutionists think they are. They are young. They were created recently. And the fossil record is mainly a record of the worldwide flood. And to date, we can actually carbon date dinosaur bones. See, people have this idea that carbon dating will give you the idea of millions of years. It doesn't. Okay, to get the idea of millions of years, they have to use other methods like potassium argon and things like that. I'll talk about that at the 1 p.m. session today. Potassium argon, that's what they use to test volcanic rocks. But carbon dating is different. Carbon dating has a very short half-life, 5,730 years. So what's that? It just means it decays so quickly that if any fossil is more than one 100,000 years, all the carbon-14 would be gone. So when you look at a fossil, if it contains carbon-14, we know it's not even 100,000 years old. That's the upper limit. You follow with me? When we look at dinosaur bones, what do we find? Carbon-14. Like I said, Brian Thomas, the one who got his PhD in Asian college, has actually carbon date many dinosaur bones. And time and time again, we have Carbon-14 dating in there. Carbon-14 dating. Radiocarbon in there. These are young. They're not millions of years old. And we can find carbon-14 in coal, in oil. We can test diamonds. Diamonds is pure carbon. And diamonds, the bonds are so tight that contamination cannot happen. Yet it contains carbon-14. It's young. Carbon-14, radiocarbon, is a good friend of the creationists. And we also find DNA. To date, there are three scientific papers that have found dinosaur DNA. Intact dinosaur DNA. Here you're looking at what we call a DAPI stain test. This is a molecule that cleaves into the minor groove of the double helical DNA. So when you get a positive stain for this, we know we have double helical DNA of a certain length. Three separate tests have found dinosaur DNA. But DNA is unstable. Even if you freeze it down, in 6.8 million years. Again, this is other evolutionist number, which I think is too generous. But using the number 6.8 million years, it will be all gone. This is not even one-tenth for when they say dinosaurs went extinct. Yet we find all this. Is dinosaurs live in climax like ours? 22,000 years maximum. All of the DNA should be gone. Yet we find that again and again. So we say DNA, dinos, not ancient. So the discovery of fossilized dinosaur soft tissue, DNA and radiocarbon is a huge problem for evolution and the idea of millions of years. So I hope you enjoyed this talk, but let me sum it up here in four points. So what have we looked at today? B, C, D and E, four points. B, we look at the Bible. We see that in Job chapter 40, yes, the Bible talked about dinosaurs. We saw that they survived the flood, they were on board the ark, and they only went extinct in more recent years. Then C, we look at centuries of dinosaur artifacts from all over the world, from China, the wine basin, from Cambodia. We saw the, the tombstone in, in the UK, showed that dinosaurs lived together with men, and they only died out in more recent years. Then we go to D, dinosaur fossils, the way they are found. We look at the droppings, they were eating grass. They were eating one another. They're found in dinosaur bone beds. Dinosaurs were eating um, birds, they were eating mammals, they were eating one another. Mammals were eating dinosaurs. You see from the fossils that the, those the long necks, they're bent backwards because at the time of death, they were in water. We see that the armored dinosaurs, they're found upside down because at the time of death, they were in water. And then finally, we saw evidence of a young earth that the fossils that we see today, we find time and time again, many hundreds of examples of original um, um, organic biomolecules in what evolutionists claim are millions of years old. We radiocarbon, that's carbon dating. They contain radiocarbon, they're young. And then we find dinosaur DNA. Friends, the earth is young, and the Bible can be trusted. Good science supports the Bible. Do you see why dinosaurs are missionary lizards? Train yourself, equip yourself in this area of dinosaurs and you can use this as a stepping stone to reach out to your kids 
and your friends. But if the evidence is so clear, why do some people still not believe? You see, I believe most people have only heard one side of the story. And that's what I want to show to you today, the other side of the story. When you start with the Word of God, everything begins to make much more sense. But there's another group of people who have heard all these things and they still choose not to believe. It's like this guy here. And he is a very well-known atheistic philosopher. But I want you to see what he says. He said this, I want atheism to be true and I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there's no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Why? See, if we are God's creation, He's the creator, we are His creation, God has the right to tell us what is right and wrong. And one day, every one of us is going to stand before God to give an account for our lives. But if we are just a product of evolution over millions of years of struggle, death and suffering, who are you to tell me what is right and wrong? I decide what I want to do for myself. But if God is our creator and we are going to stand before God to give an account for our lives, there are consequences to ideas. You cannot live your life any way we choose. And maybe if you're sitting here for many years, you heard the gospel message, you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that may be one of the most important things you can do. Get yourself right before the Lord. Because one day we are going to stand before God to give an account for our lives. And you can choose to be like this guy who covers his eyes and say, I choose not to see. But that doesn't change reality, does it? Get yourself right before the Lord. I hope you really enjoyed this talk. I hope you can see why this is such an important topic. At 1 p.m., I'll be talking about the rock layers. I'll be talking about more fossils. I'll be talking about what does the Bible say about the Word of God. But before I end of this talk, I want to end with this verse from Romans chapter 1. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. Friends, when you start with the Word of God and you look at the signs around us, everything will begin to make much more sense. So if you like this, one of the things I would encourage you to look at is Creation Magazine. This is a quarterly magazine, a family magazine. We talk about dinosaurs and things like that from the Bible. Highly recommend that because we have more testimonies of life being changed from this one magazine. There's no advertising in there. It's just designed for equipping and evangelism. Another one to consider, if you like dinosaurs, the Creation Answers book. Top 60 questions in 20 chapters. So what about dinosaurs? We have one whole chapter in there, chapter 19. What about dinosaurs? We talk about where the king and his wife. What about the ice age, global warming? What about distant starlight? What about continental drift? All answered in this one book alone. For kids elementary and above, I highly recommend this, exploring dinosaurs. with hands-on activities you can do as well. It covers a lot of the artifacts and things that we mentioned earlier on. And this, I might be a bit biased, but I'm a co-author of this book. But this just came out in September. If you're an adult here, this is written not for kids, but for high school and above. This is our most comprehensive book about dinosaurs. Two whole chapters on feathered dinosaurs. Do they exist? Do they not exist? What does the evidence say? And a lot of these things that we mentioned today in a lot more detail. And most of all, like I say, the most important thing we're talking about today is the Word of God, right? That's our foundation. And this is my favorite commentary on Genesis, just under 800 pages from Genesis 1 to 11. Talk about theology, church history, and science. So if you want a good, solid commentary on Genesis, I highly recommend this one here. So those are my best recommendations. Check some of them out at the back, and I'll be at the back answering questions. I look forward to seeing you at 1 p.m. I hope that's helpful to you. And finally, let's close with the Word of God again. You remember in Job, God was confronting Job with all his creation, all his majestic animals. At the end of it, how did Job respond? Job said this, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Confronted with the creation of God, Job humbled himself 
and he glorified the Lord. Dinosaurs should lead us to do the same thing, to glorify God. Thank you. Did y'all learn something? I learned something. That was amazing, Joel. Thank you so, so much. Like Joel said, he's going to be out in the foyer there to answer any questions. We also have uh, some snacks for you all, some coffee if you want to hang out and, uh, and eat some with us. At 1030, we're going to have our worship service. Please join us for worship. We'll have a free lunch right after that, free covered dish lunch for everyone that's here. And then uh, after that, Joel will come back up and we'll learn some more about, uh, about creation. Amen. Hey, can I pray for us? Uh, and then we'll uh, go and have some snacks and fellowship with each other. Father God, thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the, for the majesty and the beauty, the accuracy and the truth of your word that holds up. It's voracious, God, and it holds up under scrutiny. And what we see, Lord, so clearly, just looking at, at the evidence of those who don't believe it, is that your word holds true. And God, we pray that uh, you'd lead us into more and more truth. God, you would help us and to uh, submit our minds and our hearts to your word, and especially uh, to Christ as our Lord. God, thank you for today. Thank you for Joel. Thank you for this ministry. God, we pray that you would bless him. Uh, God, we pray that you would bless our fellowship. God, help everything we say, do, and think today be honoring to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Go have some great snacks. See you all in a little bit.